Our children are the living messengers we send into the future that we will never get to see. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of uh, Let's Talk podcast for human skills and mindset. Today, we are going to discuss around kids and children. As, as a parent, uh, you can, I mean, the people who are parents here, they can resonate that uh, we have certain expectations with our kids. And at the same time, we would like them to ramp up to a certain learning curves and, and understand all the things pretty quickly. And who doesn't want their kids to be a number one in the class? There are a lot of emotions comes in, but at the same time, we also would like to understand what a kid is going through. What's their learning uh, uh, speed or cycle and learning curves for that matter? And th this is some of the discussions uh, which we are going to have today about what are the different cognitive and learning disorders or challenges kids may face. So I'm today uh, in conversation with uh, Avigal Gimpel. She is an expert in uh, the ADHD and uh, dyslexia related uh, to the kids out there. Avigal, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure being here with you. Definitely, likewise. So as I mentioned that we we are going to discuss about these uh, symptoms and the value which we would like for the viewers and listeners today to get from it is to understand more about kids, empathize them, ask more questions, and learn about these different behaviors which we are going to go through. So let's get started about you, Abigail. Who, who is Abigail Gimpel and why we are maybe kind of uh, having a conversation here today? Okay. So first of all, I am a New Yorker and I've, I'm a proud mom of six children, my husband and I, Daniel. And uh, right now we are living, we're expats living in uh, right outside of Jerusalem. And my connection with ADHD goes way back when I started as a young teacher and uh, my students, uh, it was a group of students who were not quite doing well, but they were fabulous kids. I, I taught an, an only boys school. It was an, an Orthodox Jewish school and they separate the boys and the girls. And I was privileged to be teaching in the boys school because these kids were amazing. They were smart. They were curious. They everything interested them. They touched everything. They talked about everything. But try to get them to sit in the classroom. Forget it. I lost them right away during recess. We had the best time, but uh, they didn't come to school in order to socialize with their teacher at recess time. So I really had to figure out how to get these kids learning. And I spent sleepless nights trying to um, figure out what they needed, what was missing. And uh, with all that hard work and a lot of sweat and tears and a little bit more tears, I managed to create a program for these guys. And, uh, and they started to flourish. And then I kind of had a realization, an epiphany, that while we were labeling these children and we were medicating these children, these kids were totally healthy and intelligent and capable. And we just needed a new language for them, which made me incredibly passionate about getting um, these kids into the classroom in a, in a meaningful way. So I started on that path. And then as things work and got in his amazing sense of humor, uh, I landed up having my children be diagnosed with ADHD one after the next. And I had to kind of switch gears and take a deep dive into how am I going to help my own children with the ADHD diagnosis. And suddenly I'm on the other side of the desk and I'm not the teacher in charge. I am the mother trying to convince the teacher that my kid is healthy and that my kid just needs a different kind of language. And it turns out that that's much harder than you might think, especially and strangely because I had my professional background. And out of that was created the my philosophy and my intervention program, which I recently did put into a book with the second book coming out pretty soon as well. Perfect. So we we will discuss about uh, the books as well. 
So you mentioned about ADHD and uh, you started uh, having some interaction with the kids and now you have uh, kids of your own having ADHD. So for the viewers and listeners who doesn't know what ADHD is, can you just give them a brief information about it? Sure. We have a a very kind of dry, cold list in the book that's called the DSM-5. Most of us are familiar with it. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual put out by the uh, Psychiatric uh, Association uh, in America. Um, And what they talk about is different observable symptoms. And what we're seeing is kids who have a hard time sitting, have a hard time staying focused on something for a long time. They have a terrible time with transitions. They're really into something and then I want them to get to something else. It doesn't work very well. Emotionally more immature. And so they have more emotional outbursts. They tend to have social interactions that are either kind of tactless or they don't really understand the the social map and and they're constantly uh, committing social suicide. And um, what else? They, they, they tend to be risk takers. They want everything here and now and fast and interesting and dangerous. That's that's these kids. So mm-hmm. they're fabulous and fascinating and exhausting. They want all of our attention all the time. And it leaves very little attention for everybody else in the room. And teachers complain about that all the time. And, and these are symptoms that we're seeing. Sometimes we have the, the kid who's also lumped into this group who's more of the dreamer, more of the artist, and is, is very busy in their own little world, dreaming and sitting in the corner of the classroom. Not necessarily a hyper kid, but that kid is also under the umbrella of ADHD. There's a whole lot more there, but that's the basic sketch. Cool. So uh, what is the full form of ADHD, just to make sure everyone understands that? What's the word ADHD mean? Exactly, yes. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Okay. Uh, So the next question would be, you know, kids kids are naughty, right? They, They have their own moments as well. How do we know that this is just another kid or the kid has ADHD? That's a great question because at the beginning in the 1980s, when ADHD became a newly minted diagnosis in the DSM-3, parents were not rushing to get their kids diagnosed because the symptoms that we're seeing are kind of normative childhood behaviors, a kid wanting to say something to a parent and kind of cutting into the conversation. That's It's kind of childlike, a kid being a little bit spontaneous and just jumping into things or not finishing a project. Again, it's it's kind of normal for a child. But what what the Psychiatric Association is making a distinction here is that they're saying, yes, these are normative childhood behaviors. But with a child with ADHD, it's taking over the child's life and affecting the child's life in a negative way, which is a little bit dangerous because it's really a subjective diagnosis, meaning one one parent will say, no, my kid's great. I have, I have no problem with this behavior. You know, we all kind of jump around and are a little bit spontaneous. And, and that, that's the way we are in our house. And we love it. And another household, a child having a tantrum is, is crushing the parent. So and and the doctor also, depending on how rigid the doctor is, uh, that's how they're going to determine if this is a disorder or if this is normative childhood behavior, which is why diagnosis I find to be slightly problematic. Yeah. So I think uh, regarding the discussing about the diagnosis, uh, I have seen a lot of parents also kind of do not go to the doctors to get these things done because at the same time they also have a fear that uh, these fears or those things may not come true and then try to be on the fact that this is just like childlike behavior so wh- what's your what's your advice to those parents who who are trying to either delay or they don't want to accept the fact that there may be a possibility so what are your advice from the proactive measures to make sure that uh, you, uh, the the parents also do their due part. Okay, so ADHD really is 
a list of symptoms. Now, these are crushing, difficult symptoms. It's not, I'm never going to say ADHD doesn't exist, but I will say that ADHD is not something you can have. It is some symptoms that you could be exhibiting, which means that there are many different causes to these symptoms. For example, I just brought my daughter to the doctor, which is why we delayed our meeting. Um, she's having terrible stro throat pain. Now, terrible throat pain can be for many different reasons. Is it strep throat? Is it lack of sleep? Is it COVID? Is it, it, it could be a hundred things. But when we go for a diagnosis for ADHD, we generally are going to get one answer. Your child is having these behaviors and therefore it must mean that there's something wrong neurologically with your child. So when a, when a parent is kind of delaying, I think the parent kind of has this, this gut response of this is more complex than getting a diagnosis and getting a quick fix. And I would say, go parent because you're right. Now, why would a parent go for a diagnosis? There's really one main reason a parent would go for a diet. Well, two main reasons. A parent would go for a diagnosis if the parent needs their child to get extra help in school. So it helps to have a diagnosis so the, the child will get more hours of, of extra attention, which is why I went to help my kids to get a diagnosis because I felt like a little bit one-on-one -on -one teaching with the teacher would, would benefit them greatly. And especially since my kids were having trouble sitting, I wanted the teacher to be able to give the give my child the test orally sometimes, not not as a crutch, but so that my child could really exhibit their true potential. And, and so so that's one reason. The other reason would be because we want to get medication and you can't get medication without a diagnosis. If the parent does not have those two needs then I would say the most important thing is to take a journey with your child and ask, why is my child struggling? Is this an emotional stress? Is it just a behavioral thing where the child's missing habits? Or perhaps it's uh, something dietary. If we're seeing uh, uh, physiological symptoms like a runny nose, headache, asthma, autoimmunity, those kind of things, then I want to look at that. And that's that's what I do with parents. I walk them through this journey so that we could discover what's wrong and therefore deal with the problem. You cannot, as a parent, stick your head in the ground and hope the problem will go away. It doesn't work. It doesn't go away. And if you do that, you're essentially abandoning your child and leaving your child alone to face the school system, which doesn't really feel very forgiving and loving toward your child. So you can't ignore it. But you don't necessarily have to run for a diagnosis as long as you're making sure to take this journey and figuring out what's wrong with your child and what, what your child is struggling with. Makes sense. So does ADHD is, uh, kind of fade away into the adulthood or because this is, I think, what I have read, it's primarily starts from maybe like five or six years aged up to 17, if I'm not wrong. So does that like, if it's not timely diagnosed, does it fade away or what are the repercussions or what kind of the impact would be having in the kid's adult life or maybe the people around them? Well, this is a big kind of argument within the scientific uh, medical community. There are those who say that it fades right away. The voices that say that it doesn't and it carries into adulthood are much louder. The question is, are they louder because they are representing the pharmaceutical companies and then you have a patient for life or because they're correct? I don't know. What I do know is that if the reason the person has ADHD symptoms is because of anxiety or, or stress or some kind of trauma that, that the child's going through, if that's not resolved, it doesn't fade. And therefore that has to be di directly addressed. If the child has some kind of physiological problem where their gut has dysbiosis, that also doesn't fade. And it has to be addressed. And there's a, a simple way to address it. And in addition, there's one cause of ADHD, which I would say is genetic, and that is a healthy personality, which I call instant gratification personality, which is that kid who turns into adult, who very much is my husband as well, 
who wants everything to be quick and now and fun and exciting and interesting. Now, if you have that kind of personality, you're going to have a really hard time creating habits because habits, as, as you and I both as adults know, that you have to do repetition. You have to like at your work. You have to, in order to get good at what you do, you have to keep at it. You have to practice it every single day. If you have an instant gratification personality, you don't want to practice things every day. You want to jump to the next thing that's exciting. And dotting the the I and crossing the T and, and the nitty gritty stuff, it's not for you. But if you don't develop those habits, then adulthood looks really messy. The people who grow out of ADHD, and there are many of them, what they've done is they've developed healthy habits. And then by the time they're 15, 16, 17, they know how to study and they've expanded their abilities and they've expanded and, and created new neural pathways. So they're well on their way to grand success. And every single person with ADHD symptoms could, could, could really succeed. There's no reason not to, but they do need help. Yes, yeah, that's true. I think at any point in time, whether we are a kid or adult, we might need some help. And it's very important that the people who are around us should be very much aware. There's yeah. one thing called self-awareness, but but you cannot expect from kids at that point. So you, uh, as a parent, has a responsibility, as you rightly mentioned, that do not ignore any kind of symptoms. There's no, uh, There's nothing wrong to get diagnosed done and see and get a peace of mind that because you are doing a very big, uh, I would say, benefit or service to the kids that if something is being diagnosed, I know one of the friend uh, who went to when uh, to the doctor when uh, his kid was four years old, doctor really applauded that, okay, it's, it's too early, but at the same time, they, uh, they applauded to the fact that they are so much proactive and they are trying to reach out. So I think this is something which parents should learn to make sure that uh, everyone around the kids as well as the kids should have a very healthy uh, life ahead. Can so, I interject there? Sure, Just please. one thing about uh, the teacher, about the mm -hmm. doctor, I'm sorry, about mm -hmm. the doctor saying that it's too early. I would disagree with that. Okay. When you see that your four-year-old is struggling, that's exactly the time to start helping your four-year-old. The doc, what the doctor is saying, it's too early to medicate. And I would say at many ages, it's too early to medicate because that might not be, the child doesn't have a Ritalin deficiency, but the child has a deficiency of something and maybe it's boundaries and maybe the parents just haven't figured out how to discipline this child properly, lovingly, respectfully. And therefore, four years old is when you begin. The doctor only has one tool in his toolkit. But parents, if they learn properly, which is why I wrote the book, so that there's no parent who doesn't have a toolkit. Because you can learn how to parent better, more clearly, with more boundaries. And you can learn to discover if your child is struggling from any other issues. And guess what? If you start then, then you might get to six when the doctor thinks now's the right time to start treating. And it could very well be your child will not need treatment of, of a medical sort. And you really have will have worked things out. And I know that when I start treating young children, especially those four years old, I'm thrilled when parents come to me when their kid is four, because then I could put the kid on a diet if they've got a runny nose, if they get headaches and stomach aches. And wow, we see amazing changes. It's miraculous. When they're young is when we want to start working on, on these habits so that they're ready for life. Exactly. So my next question would be towards uh, difference or maybe similarity between the ADHD and dyslexia. Uh, these things are very interchangeably used. So how people can uh, differ from uh, these two symptoms? Well, one of them is a specific learning disability. Dyslexia is a specific learning disability in reading. Now, people get a little bit confused with dyslexia and think that it, what it is is kids reading backwards. Uh, it's not that. It's just a reading problem. It's an, actually a processing of reading problem. And the, the dyslexic mind processes very differently than, the, than, than a normative mind. Dyslexic people see the full picture. 
as opposed to the small details. They don't know what you want from them when you ask them to read and decode these tiny little details. They're very good at big picture. They can conceptualize. I have a son with dyslexia. Get him working on a project to build something. He already sees the project in his mind completed before he begins. And that's a wonderful kind of mind, but they need to learn to decode. Those are the, even though we find that in about 60% of the pace, cases of ADHD, we have an overlap with some learned disability, they don't necessarily overlap. And, and dyslexia is only one kind of disability. So, so we will see a percentage of kids with ADHD symptoms that have dyslexia as well, but many kids with ADHD don't have any learned disabilities at all. Okay. And are these a hereditary? I'm sorry, what did you uh, say? Are these a hereditary? Like it's coming uh, from yeah. the um, Both of them are highly hereditary. Okay. Uh, my husband is both dyslexic and ADHD. And one word about dyslexia is that it's very easy to overcome the reading part. Not very easy. The child might become fluent at reading uh, in the fourth grade or the seventh grade. But this is something that parents have to understand. This is not a curse for life. Dyslexia is definitely presents a huge challenge, but if we can get our children through it and let them know that they're so strong at other things and this is their challenge, then they will get through it fairly well. It does take a hit to the self-esteem as, as well as ADHD. Both of those definitely will hit the child's self-esteem and make them question if they're normal, if they're good, if they're healthy, if they're smart, which is a real shame. Because in most cases, kids with ADHD have higher IQs as well as high, uh, kids with dyslexia because it's a, just a different way of processing. But both of them definitely are, are hereditary. We, we don't usually see dyslexia in, in a void where, where we don't see a parent or a grandparent uh, that, that had it as well. Got it. So as you mentioned about all these uh, uh, thought-provoking things about uh, the ADHD and dyslexia. Let's uh, let's go towards uh, the book uh, which you have uh, authored. So, can you just give us uh, some information about uh, the name of the book, uh, from where we can get it, and what exactly the value people can get it uh, from uh, the book here? All right, so I'll show you my book because I like the cover. Um, it's called Hyper Healing, and uh, it's the Empowered Parents Complete Guide to Raising a Healthy Child with ADHD symptoms. What's important to me is to stress that it's a healthy child and the child is dealing with symptoms. Uh, what the value of the book is, and there are many books on ADHD on the market, and there are some really good books, and I quote them in my book as well. So I have a lot of respect for a lot of the work that's come before me, and I'm just continuing that work. Uh, but what I'm adding is that I'm, I'm looking at the child as a healthy child, and I'm saying, let's look at the child and figure out where the child is struggling. And then I'm going to provide you with an action plan for that child, for the specific area that the child is struggling in. Because what I saw the problem was that, number one, diagnosis was way too simplistic. And uh, what we hear from the doctor doesn't really explain anything. So the parent walks out of that doctor's appointment confused, disturbed, depressed, my child is broken, my child is disordered, when that's the opposite of the truth. So I don't want any parent feeling alone with this terrible piece of news that their child is, is somehow not good. Uh, so that's number one. And number two is, if the parent is lucky enough to know that there are so many things that cause ADHD, it, it does the parent have enough money to get coaching, to get help for that child? So I don't want to have any parent to know that there is help to get, but not be able to afford it. And therefore, I put my entire program into a book. You don't have to meet me. You could read the program and you can figure out who your child is and follow it very, very clearly. I'm a teacher. So I write it like a teacher. I, I review every chapter at the end. I give you specific homework so that you can follow it and you can start seeing major changes in your child. One thing I want to add is that when parents get the book, I highly recommend the, that they get a group together. And this way they can have what I would call a support information group where they meet once a week 
They go through a chapter and then they discuss what their plan is going to be for that week. And they have feedback by WhatsApp. They open a WhatsApp group and everyone could write down what their successes were, what they were having trouble with. And that way, as a community, parents will flourish. They don't need to pay even a penny to get that going because the book is enough for as a guide for them to for them to create this group. That's my big dream. OK, that's amazing. I think uh, uh, I look forward to reading uh, your book as well. Whether it's ADHD or not, I think every person should be aware of these things. Because even if your child is not suffering with these uh, disorders, uh, at least you can educate the other parents out there. So right. it's always the education um, is not restricted to yourself. So definitely I'm, I'm looking forward for reading this book. So let's go towards uh, the end of the conversation here, um, Abigail. So at this point, what would be your parting thought to the people, to the parents, to the community as a whole throughout the world? Because each and every country and community has different exposure level about these things. So what would be maybe few points you would like to uh, convey to the people out there if they want to get started, irrespective from where they are in the world? Okay, so the first thing I want parents to know is that their children are healthy. That's the first thing. Don't panic. See your child the same way you saw your child before you walked into that doctor's office. The second thing is that we need compassionate curiosity. Look at your child and start asking questions. Reintroduce yourself to your child. Shake your child's hand and say, hey, I'm mom, I'm dad. Let's start at the beginning. What's going on with you? And start paying attention to little things. Like, for example, are you seeing that your child is spending hours on their screen? Is it perhaps a screen addiction that's causing this ADHD symptoms? If your child's a homebody and home all the time and never moves and is a couch potato, maybe it's time to look at getting your child back into nature and getting your child moving, exercising, hiking. So we have to look at it and say, what in our environment is not helping my child flourish? Because ADHD essentially is a clash between a child and that child's environment. And usually the child is responding appropriately to something that's off in the environment. So we have to know that it could be something that the choices a child's making, and it could be that my discipline is not quite a good fit for the child. Now, the thing I want to warn parents about is don't start blaming yourself. You are not the cause of your child's challenge, but you are the family leader and you could help your child get out of these challenges. So self-blaming is not going to get you anywhere. And it's somehow, for some reason, that's the first place we go. And then we're so hurt that we cause the problem that we can't even find a solution. So don't go there. Go to my child's healthy. I'm here. I'm amazing because I'm paying attention to the details and uh, and start taking that curious, respectful journey with your family. That's that's great talk. Uh, so thank you, Abigail, for, for providing this amazing uh, insights about uh, the ADHD. And I'm sure a lot of people would uh, get value and start thinking about it. And uh, I will recommend everyone to please go research as much as possible and obviously go through uh, your book to see what are uh, the different uh, information you may get and then try to uh, see the child, what kind of categories they fit into and then try to work towards that. So that's yes. great. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Uh, so Abigail, thank, thanks so much again for your time on this. And and please do the good work, what you're doing. I would add one more thing. If anyone does want yes. to get in touch with me yes. and ask a personal question, I'm always happy to answer. And you can do that through my website, hyperhealing.org. And there, there's a form you could fill out with your own personal question. And if you ask anyone who has gotten in touch with me before you, uh, I always respond and I'm always happy to give an extra helping hand. I was a young mother that was lost, didn't know what to do many years ago. So all of you young parents out there that are feeling alone, you're not alone. And I'm always happy to 
hear your story and to communicate with you. Sure. And uh, the last thing, I'll, I'll put all the information about Abigail's, uh, uh, how you can approach her and the book link and all the information so that you can uh, get enlightened yourself about uh, these uh, uh, the issues as well. So thank you again. Thank you so much for having me.